Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here to talk about our thinking over the last 15 years about the power systems. And I really would like to thank the organizer for the invitation and uh, uh, for me to come to this beautiful country. It's really nice. And I took quite a few uh, pictures outside. I was uh, going to put one of them here, but I didn't manage. Okay. But it's a really nice country and good food and nice people. So I am going to talk about uh, electricity. We have talked about a lot. Okay. So we all know that uh, um, uh, electricity is very important to us. But you may have heard that the, actually the electrification or power uh, um, uh, systems is actually the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century, which is selected by the um, U.S. National Academy of Engineering. And also, it's regarded as the largest and most complex machine engineered by humankind. So very big, very complex, and uh, a lot of problems, a lot of problems. And now you know that our topic will be going to power electronics. Okay. And the power system actually uh, getting even larger. In Europe, the member states' uh, um, power systems are being collected together to uh, form a super grid in Europe. And also in the U.S., a lot of high-voltage AC links and high-voltage DC links are being, being um, built to link the whole system together as one big system. And this is also happening in China. A lot of high-voltage AC links and high-voltage DC links are being built to form a strong and a smart power system in China. So a lot of them are happening. Power systems are getting bigger and bigger. At the same time, power systems are being democratized as well. What means by democratization. It means becoming smaller and smaller in terms of the generators and the players in the system. For example, recently there was a report saying that in China, uh, this year only, they are closing 103 coal-fired power plants. And we are also hearing that some of the nuclear power plants are being retiring and or stopped being built. And this is happening in the U.S. and in, in India as well. And uh, these power generations are uh, power generations are being replaced by uh, renewables wind turbines, solar panels, and also we are putting a lot of other things like electric vehicles, storage systems into the grid. Okay. And also we expect the load to become an active player in the system stability as well. So power systems are being democratized. What could happen? Getting larger and larger at the same time, a lot of more uh, uh, players are adding to the system. What could happen? Something very bad called blackouts. And indeed, last year, um, in September, the South Australia was blacked out, and 850,000 people were left without electricity. Um, that is very, very bad, and a lot of losses there. And the final report found out that it was actually the action of a control setting responding to multiple deficits that led to the black system. Okay? The wind turbines, um, managed to, some of them managed to ride through the degree disturbances, but some of them because the the incorrect settings, and they didn't manage, and then eventually the whole system will uh, black out. So this is happening, okay? And then the question for us is that how to maintain system stability and keep lights on? Why is the power system getting larger and larger and with more and more players adding to the system? How can we keep our lights on? We want that, right? Okay? And that's a very, very challenging problem. Very challenging problem. And, uh, and I think, okay, whenever I have this kind of um, uh, challenging problem, I always go beyond the engineering. And in this case, particular case, I was trying to look for solutions from the history. As history often repeats itself, and in one way or another, and they will have a lot of things we can learn from history. And um, we know that China has got a continuing history of over 5,000 years. There are a lot of things for us to, to learn. And actually, what is happening nowadays in power systems is very similar to what happened in the history of China. So I would like to show you what this this. Yes, okay, and see how we can learn from the history of China. I will have a, a hundred second video uh, to go through the 5,000 years of history, and let's see how we're going to do it. Thousands of years ago, several cultures emerged in the East. Well, China is not. About 5,000 years ago, Chinese characters were invented and have been evolving since then. About 2,300 years ago, that land was highly democratized with 100 schools of thought, such as Confucianism, Legalism, Taoism, and Moism. However, 
it was filled with chaos and bloody battles. In 221 BC, Emperor Qin united China and unified Chinese characters, currency, trade, and communication. This has laid a structurally stable foundation for Chinese culture. He means harmony. It lies in the center of Chinese culture and has safeguarded its stability and prosperity, even after being invaded. With this, Chinese made great inventions such as printing, paper making, compasses, and gunpowder. This harmonizing principle has also been instrumental for 1.4 billion Chinese to live in harmony. Today, I will talk about how to harmonize democratized power systems with this principle to make our planet more sustainable. Okay, I will start um, talking about the challenges again of the power systems and then try to identify what is the fundamental challenge we face in the power system. And then after we've identified the fundamental challenges, then we're going to solve that cha fundamental challenge. Then, then, then solve this, all the challenges on the surface we see. Okay, so I will present to you the concept of a synchronized and democratized smart grid, in short, Sendam. I will be talking about what we see very familiar in the, uh, in the politics. The, uh, about the dem democracy. So we will be talking about the rule of law, the legal equality in power systems, how we're going to implement this in power system. And I will show you the um, 11 technologies we have developed, which we call the virtual synchronous machines, and then show you the unified Sundam grid architecture. I will also show you some of the uh, information about the test bed we have developed in, the, uh, in my university, in Illinois Institute of Technology. Okay, and if I have some uh, more time, then I will show you something weird. Okay, now let's recall the challenges we were uh, in power systems. One thing we talk about is that power systems are getting larger and larger with the increasing consumptions. And generators are becoming smaller, but the number of the generators is exploding. Okay, and the power systems, as I mentioned, they need to be more efficient. Okay, we need to make sure that power systems are more, much more efficient. We all understand these challenges. We all understand this, but what is the fundamental challenge behind these challenges on the surface? Are we able to find something which is fundamental among all of them? Okay, look at the first one. Power systems are getting larger with increasing consumption. If you look at the appliances you buy nowadays, you will realize that most of them come with a power electronic converter inside it. Okay, so that means what's behind this challenge is that more power electronic converters are being added into this into the power elect power systems. And look at the second challenge. Renewables, electric vehicles, storage systems, they all need power electronic converters to process them, right? So that means we are adding even more power electronic converters into the power systems. The third one, we need to control the power system to make the power system more efficient. How are we going to do that? We need to use power electronic converters because at this power electronic converter is probably the best uh, controller we can use to control electricity, which is varying at 50 hertz or 60 hertz. So that means we are adding even more power electronic converters in your system. So putting all this together, the fundamental challenge we are facing in power systems is that future power systems will be power electronics based with a huge number of non-synchronous incompatible players. At the moment, power systems are electric machines based because you have generators, uh, collective transmission and distribution network, and then you have motors Connected to the transmission, uh, connected to the distribution network as well. So at the moment, power systems are electric machines based. But in the future, power systems will be power electronics based, with a huge number of non-synchronous incompatible players. So this is a completely different scenario. Okay. So it's less of a power problem, but more of a systems problem. It's not about collecting wind turbine to the grid or collecting a rooftop solar panel to the grid. It's about the system. Okay, the system stability, how we can keep our lights on. So that is a very, very important shift of the, the challenge. Okay? And another thing that about the communication. Whenever we talk about smart grid, we are talking about adding communication network into the power system. But we shouldn't forget, power system is a network of, um, it's a power network. It's not a, 
a communication network. Okay, so we, and if we have this communication network in the system, that's going to give us a lot of benefit for sure. But it's going to bring uh, concerns on reliability and uh, cybersecurity. Okay, we have to be very, very careful about that because we want to keep our lights on even if the communication network is down. So that is something very, very important. It's fine for us to have the communication network for the high-level functions like the SCADA, electricity market, that's fine. But for the low-level control, we, should rely on, we shouldn't rely on communication network. Okay, so how are we going to operate our future power systems? With coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, and all other newcomers, new add-on generations, and the, the flexible loads here. Okay, how are we going to do that? I mentioned in the video that the harmonizing principle has brought sustainability and uh, stability to China for over 200 years. Okay? Are we able to harmonize our power systems? Because at this moment, power systems are having so many different um, uh, players in bo on board. Are we able to harmonize them? Okay? Or in other words, to unify the power system operation? Okay? And in the video, I mentioned that uh, actually before harmonization, actually China went through the democratization process, okay? So, if we're going to harmonize power systems, how, can we actually democratize power systems using tech, technical technologies? It's not just about talking about it, right? We need to find the technology that allows us to democratize power systems. So in that sense, we need to really look at the democracy, okay? We all know that democracy is a politic concept that empowers all eligible individuals to play a equal role in decision making. However, we all know that actually in a democratized society, significantly different or even divisive opinions could appear. Okay? That is not acceptable for power systems because we need to re make sure that power systems frequency will be stable at around 50 hertz or 60 hertz. We need to be sure that the voltage is stable as well. So we cannot allow divisive opinions in a democratized power system. We have to make sure that. What does that mean? It means that we ha have to make sure that all the players will be able to synchronize their action so that they are working for the same goal, not different goals, okay? Not their own goals, not their own opinion. They have to synchronize their action, okay, for the same goal. So this brings up the concept of synchronization and democratization not just democratization, we also need synchronization. That is what we have come up, the concept of sendam. Okay. Now, for power systems, okay, um, we have to look at what key features we need to implement. Okay. For a uh, democratized society, there are two important features. One is called the rule of law, and the other is called the legal equality. The rule of law basically says that all players should follow the same rule. And the legal equality says that all players are equal and they should be treated equally, okay? And if we want to implement Sendam, smart grid, how we have to make sure that we have these two features embedded into the Sendam smart grid, right? Okay, so for a Sendam smart grid, we need to find one simple mechanism for all power systems players to follow, okay? We can't, we, can, we need to find one simple mechanism, okay, that everybody is able to follow. And also, this mechanism should allow all the players to synchronize their action. So that is very, very important, okay? And for the legal equality, that means we need to make sure that we are able to equalize all the players in the system, okay? At the moment, there are many, many different players, and the stability is regulated by the large uh, facilities, the coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, okay? But in the future, are we able to make sure that the new add-on of generations, like the wind farms, solar panels, electric vehicles, also to play an equal role in regulating the system stability? Okay? And is it possible for most of the loads to play the same role as well? Because a power system consists of generators, but also a lot of loads. At the moment, the loads are passive. They are not taking part in the regulation of system stability. So, are we able to make sure that they can be equalized, they can also take part in the uh, uh, regulation of system stability? And if we can make this happen, are we able to equalize all the players regardless of their size and the capacity, whether they are kilowatts, rooftop solar panels, or gigawatt nuclear power station? Are we able to do that, okay? And this is uh, the, the, the question that we need to solve, okay? And in order to answer these questions, we need to understand 
What rule has underpinned the operational growth of the power systems for over the last 100 years? Okay, we need to understand that because we said that power system is the largest man-made machine in the world. We cannot rebuild the power system. We need to understand the, the system and then see okay, how we are able to put the newcomers into the system. So that is very, very important. Okay, so there are many different types of generation systems in the system. But if you look at them, okay, you will find that all the electric generation, okay, the generators in the current power plants, they are using synchronous machines. Synchronous machines. They are all using synchronous machines. Why? Okay, there must be a reason, right? Okay, why has the industry decided to use synchronous machines instead of DC machines or induction machines? There must be a reason, right? Okay, and the reason is that because synchronous machines have got a very good property, an intrinsic property. That is the synchronization mechanism. If you collect synchronous machines together, they are going to synchronize, their, um, um, uh, together, uh, synchronize with each other. And if you collect a synchronous machine with the grid, it's going to synchronize with the grid. Okay? That is a very, very good um, characteristic. And it is this intrinsic synchronization mechanism that has underpinned the operation and growth of power systems over the last 100 years. Okay, this is a very simple mechanism in the power system, this synchronization mechanism. And actually this synchronization mechanism is a very fundamental um, mechanism in the nature. Okay, many people have um, um, uh, studied this. Okay, and so what I'm going to say is that actually this synchronization mechanism is the natural rule of law for our future Sendam smart grid. Okay, because it's already been there for over 100 years, and if we are able to use this for the future, then that is going to be the natural rule of law for our future Sendam smart grid. Okay, now we have found the rule of law. Let's look at the legal equality. How we are going to equalize all the players. Let's start with the new add-on of generations. Okay, because we now already know that the conventional generators are synchronous machines, they have the synchronous uh, uh, synchronization mechanism there. Now, let's look at the new add-ons of the generations. The wind turbines, solar panels, and also electric vehicles, storage systems, okay? They are all different. They are all different. Are we able to find something in common among all these different players, among all these different players, okay? And actually, we, most of us know that they actually use a common device, power electronic converter, okay, for the integration to the grid, okay? So I'm not going to explain you how, uh, the, what this is and how it works because you're all experts in this area. So my question is that, can we equip this synchronization mechanism of synchronous machines into this power electronic converter? In this case, it's an inverter that converts the DC um, uh, uh, electricity to the AC, okay? And with some uh, um, low-pass filters here, okay? Can we equip this power electronic inverters with the synchronization mechanism of synchronous machines. Or more specifically, can we operate this as virtual synchronous machines? As virtual synchronous machines? And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes. We have demonstrated this uh, some years ago, uh, about 10 years ago now. And this is, we call them virtual synchronous machines. That is to operate these power electronic converters as to have the internal dynamics and the external properties of synchronous machines. Okay, over the last 10 years, we have developed three generations of technologies, and one, the first generation is called, we call them synchroverters, synchroverters. And this is a very basic and conceptual implementation of the virtual synchronous machines. And it's designed for uh, power electronic converters having the inductive impedances, because most of us know that power electronic converters have got the LC filter there, and that the low frequency uh, range, it, is, it has got this inductive impedance, okay? But we also know that power electronic converters may have different types of impedances. For example, resistive, or even capacitive, okay? Uh, or even complex, okay? In this case, if you use the same control technologies, it may not work. So we have developed the second generation of virtual synchronous machines, based on our patented technology called a robust uh, tube controller, okay? And this, if at the end, okay, in the future research, we have actually proven that this is a universal controller for inverters or converters having different types of impedances. It doesn't matter whether it's inductive, capacitive, resistive, or complex. As long as you can build it, this controller can be used, okay? This robust tube controller can be used. It's universal, okay? 
But still, the stability is a concern. How are we going to formally prove the stability? So recently, we have uh, developed a third generation of technology. That's called the CyberSync machines. And these CyberSync machines are actually passive. Are actually passive, OK? That means if they are if themselves stable. They are themselves stable. And if you collect these sync, the CyberSync machines to a passive network, the network is going to be stable as well. So we are approaching the end of proving the stability of the whole network. So that's what we are, we are, we are working on at the moment. Okay. So now, let me spend a few, um, um, one or two minutes about the first generation of uh, virtual sync machines to show you the basic idea. Okay. The basic idea is to take the mathematical model of synchronous machines, which is given here, and the upper part is the um, um, swing equation. Okay. We take the mathematical model of synchronous machine as the core of the controller for the power electronic inverter. Okay? And then we put the generated voltage E and then convert it into P, uh, PWM passes to drive these switches. Okay? And then we measure the current flowing out of the, control, uh, the converter and put it back to the mathematical model. So by doing this too, we have actually linked the mathematical model of synchronous machine together with the power stages. Okay, and this forms the core of the virtual synchronous machine. And then, on top of that, you can introduce the mature technology like the frequency drop control, voltage drop control, onto it, and then form the, the synchronous inverter. Okay, so this is the accompanied controller for a um, synchronous inverter, the first generation of synchronous machines. The red blocks are the mathematical mode of synchronous machine. And then we have added this block to regulate the frequency. Okay. And we have added this block to regulate the reactive power and this block to regulate the voltage. And here, of course, we can also convert the real power into electromagnetic torque. That means in this compact controller, we are able to regulate the real power, reactive power, frequency, and voltage. You can easily achieve a unity power factor or some other function within this compact controller. And in the first generation or the initial synchronous inverter, we had a phase lock loop here. Okay? But I'm going to tell you later how we are able to do something about this. Okay. So this indeed, and then we put this into the uh, experiments and indeed it worked. Okay? And it worked as we expected. We did some experiments when I was in the UK and the frequency is 50 hertz, you see, and uh, it's varied around 50 hertz. But the real power sent to the grid automatically changed, okay, according to the change in frequency. According to the fre change in frequency. And that's, that's wonderful. That's exactly what the utility company are asking for, are asking for, okay? And without communication, without communication, you just collect to the grid and then it will sense the, the, the frequency and then change the output, real output, okay? Similarly for the, for the uh, voltage. So in this way we have, we are able to make all the generators harmonized and they can take the equal uh, regulation of the grid stability, okay? But how about the loads? How about the loads? There are many types of different loads in a power system, like the home appliances, lighting devices, computers, and all different sorts, okay? And it's very difficult to model these, uh, these, uh, these machines, okay, these, these loads, okay? The question we're asking here is the system, the problem, the system's question. So, is there anything in common among all these different loads, among all these different loads, okay? And then we found a report from the EFRI, and this is that, okay, all those are different types of loads, but about 50% of electricity or more is consumed by motors, okay? About 10% of electricity is consumed by internet devices, and about 20% of electricity is consumed by lighting devices, and the rest of loads consume the rest 20% of electricity. That's interesting, that's interesting, because we talk about that we need to make the power system more efficient, okay? And if you want to make the loads more efficient, then you will be looking at this area. How we make the motor applications more efficient. One way is to redesign the motors, okay? Another way is to add a motor drive so that we can change the speed of the motor and then we can make it more efficient. What is a motor drive? A motor drive is actually a rectifier plus a inverter if it's an AC machine, okay? So that means these 50% of electricity will be consumed by rectifiers. The internet devices. Internet devices consume DC electricity. So that means this 10% of electricity will also be consumed by rectifiers as well, or are consumed by rectifiers. Lighting. 
20% of electricity consumption. And we all know that the lighting market is moving towards LED lights. LED consumes DC electricity as well. So that means in the future, about 80% or even 90% of electricity will be consumed by rectifiers, by rectifiers, okay? That is very, very interesting, right? If we are, the question now for us is, are we able to make these rectifiers to behave like virtual synchronous motors? If we are able to make these rectifiers to behave like virtual synchronous motors, then they will all have the synchronization mechanism embedded, okay? And we have done this. In about 2010, we made, managed to operate the rectifiers as a virtual synchronous motors. What we did is similar. Okay, we, put the, take the, we took the mathematical model of synchronous machine, which is very similar to those of the uh, synchronous generators, and then added a very small controller here, PI controller, to regulate the DC bus voltage. Because for rectifiers, the DC bus voltage is very important, right? And then you can also regulate the reactive power. Even more, even better that if you want to regulate the voltage, you can add the voltage group here so that the load will be able to regulate the voltage as well, okay? But here we didn't have it, but you can do it, okay? So with this, okay, we are actually turning these rectifiers or the loads into virtual synchronous machines. And this is the experiment results we had. And the blue line is the frequency inside our rectifiers and it follows the grid frequency very, very well, or better. So they are interacting with the grid to form this, this, uh, this uh, frequency. And you can see this is the DC bus voltage and it's able to regulate, okay. So indeed, we have managed to make the load to behave like virtual synchronous motors. And in addition to what we did to make the inverters have the synchronization mechanism synchronous machines, right? So more or less we are done, right? So we are able to make all the power electronic converters as virtual synchronous machines. Is there any problem left? Any problem left? Have you noticed something? I think I mentioned this, okay? There is a dedicated synchronization unit, or a PLL, okay? In the inverter, we had the PLL here in the first design, and also in the, recti uh, in the rectifiers, we have a, uh, had the STA, sinusoidal tracking algorithm block. That is a, a variant of the phase lock loop, okay? Anyway, that is what we had. Okay, had this phase lock loop there, but, I, I was fed up with face lock loops. I guess you are all fed up with the face lock loops as well. Very, very difficult to tune and causes a lot, lot of problems to the stability. If the face lock loops so bad, why can't we just take, get rid of them? And we managed to do that. Okay, now we have got rid of the face lock loops. You no longer need a face lock loop for your power electronic converter. Now, let's look at this one. We, so for the sync converters, we had a self synchronized sync converters without phase lock loop at all, okay? Even for the pre-synchronization, you don't need it, okay? So what we did is that with the synchronverter, we added a small block here, okay? And also another block here. And with these two blocks, we are able to synchronize our virtual synchronous machines with the grid even before you close the circuit breaker, okay? And of course, once we synchronize it, you can close the circuit breaker. It's not a problem, okay? So we have done that, and it, it works, okay? These are the... Uh, experiment results. The upper one shows you the frequency inside this self-synchronized synchronverter, okay? And the bottom one is the frequency we observed, we measured through a PLL, okay, phase uh, lock loop. And you can see that the frequency inside our virtual synchronous machine is much cleaner, okay, than this one, okay? That means if you use a phase lock loop, you will never get a performance like this, okay? Because that's the reference you have to use for the the, the, the converter, and in our case, we don't need that. Okay, we don't need the phase lock loop. Okay, so we, we can, okay. And also for the rectifiers, for the rectifiers, we did similar change to the original controller, added this block, and this block, and then we are able to achieve self-synchronization before you collect the grade. And then make sure that the, the you, when you collect the grade, it's seamless, it's seamless. And the, um, this is the experimental results. At this time, we put the frequency of the virtual synchronous machine on top of the grid frequency. And you can see the difference, right? It's very, very um, clean, and the performance is much, much better. <coughs> okay, so indeed, we have achieved nuclear equality. Whether they are generators or new add-on, whether they are conventional or new add-on generators, whether they are generators or loads, whether they are large or small, they can all behave like virtual synchronous machines or synchronous machines. 
and follow the same rule of law, the synchronization mechanism of synchronous machines. So we are able to achieve this uh, legal equality. That is, that is great, right? So now, let me show you the overall architecture of the future power systems we have, we have come up for the next generation smart grids. Okay? It looks like this. For the conventional power plants, the fossil fuel power plants, nuclear power plants, hydro power plants, you don't need to do, make any change. Okay? You, do, you collect them through the synchronous machines to the transmission and distribution network. Okay? And for the new add-on generations, wind turbines, solar farms, micro, DC microgrid, electric storage, electric vehicles, you control the power electron inverters as virtual synchronous machines. Okay, virtual synchronous machine, VSL. And for the majority of the loads that have got a rectifier there, you control the rectifier as a virtual synchronous motor. Okay, so after you have done this, then you look at these players, the active players from the transmission and distribution network side, all you see are synchronous machines. Some of them are physical synchronous machines, some of them are virtual synchronous machines. So it becomes a harmonized and a unified architecture for our future power systems. Okay? And a very important feature here is that you don't need communication network for these, these guys to interact with each other because they have the synchronization mechanism embedded into them. Okay? This is an intrinsic synchronization mechanism. They are able to talk to each other through the transmission and distribution network okay? to maintain the basic operation. Okay? If you want to have a communication network on top of it, you can do it. But it's not necessary to maintain the basic service to keep our lights on. Okay? So that is very, very important. Okay? Now, we have built up a test bed in our uh, lab at Illinois Tech, in the Illinois Institute of Technology. We have uh, 12 converters here, 12 virtual tanks from skin scale. And actually, we have configured it as a 10-node system, as a 10-node system. Okay? So we have these two working as a wind turbine, and these two working as wind turbine, and we have solar panels, solar panels, the AC load, AC load, DC load, DC load, and these two are operated as grid collection. Okay, so back-to-back -back grid collection. So we are able to island this system or collect this system to the grid. Okay, we, uh, we have managed to run this system uh, without problem. Okay, we are still uh, improving uh, this, and, uh, but it, it works, it works, okay? And we have designed all the um, um, virtual synchronous machines from scratch. Okay, the, the, the power boards, the control boards, and the, uh, even we're using our own topologies, okay, which have other aspects which I don't have time to, to mention here today. Okay, so that that's really works. Okay, it has demonstrated the concept, and it's able to uh, have a stable system with a power electronics dominated power system. Okay, and the front, looks nice, right? But do you want to see the back? The back is a bit mess. Okay. <laughs> a lot of wires, a lot of wires, okay. But you know how it works, right? Okay, so that is um, the back and uh, it, um, it shows the, the hard work of the students that they are putting there, okay. It, it has been um, a challenge to put all this together, okay. But anyway, it's, it works. Now, I mentioned the South Australia blackout at the beginning. Now, let's say that, let's assume that if they had already got the send dump smart grid deployed there, what's it going to be, uh, uh, look like, okay? And of course, we won't be able to avoid the tornadoes, the voltage dips, the faults, this kind of things. We cannot. But we, for sure, we are able to contain the damages from spreading, okay? From being spreaded, okay? And because the wind turbines operated at virtual synchronous machines are grid friendly, they will try to remain collected, okay? They will do whatever they can to support the grid, okay? Because they have the synchronization mechanism is built into them, they will do whatever they can to support the grid. And also, most of the loads will autonomously change their power intakes in response to the grid event, okay? So that means some of the loads will probably uh, reduce their loads and then, or even completely stop, okay? And in all, putting all this uh, effort together, then, the chance of having this blackout would have significantly been reduced, okay? We cannot claim that it's going to completely eliminate blackout, but the chance will be significantly reduced. So that is going to be wonderful, right? Okay, so uh, that is the main details about uh, the technicals about uh, my talk. I didn't have equations for you. I know you, you don't like them. So, but I kept all these details in this. The, the, I have, we have two books. 
So this book uh, was published in 2013, and uh, which contains a lot of things about power quality, the neutral line provision, the imbalanced nodes, and the synchronization, and the uh, tube control, uh, all these sort of things here. Okay, a lot of the experimental results there. And what I talk about today is mainly included in this, in this book. Okay, it's coming out, uh, hopefully in the next few months, and it's going to cover all the, um, the details, the concept, the technology, and the experimental results, and also the implementation in the, virtual, uh, in the wind turbines, solar panels, all these kind of things, we will have the details in there. So if you want to learn more details, then um, you can look at this. Okay, now let me quickly summarize um, my talk. Okay, I have said, okay, power systems are being democratized, and a lot of distributed generators and flexible loads are, are being required to take part in the grid regulation. And I pointed out that the fundamental challenge in power systems is that future power systems will be power electronics based instead of electric machines based. And another uh, characteristic is that the number of players is going to be huge, millions or billions of them, okay? How can we actually make sure the system is going to be stable? That is the challenge we all need to, to solve. Of course, for our power electronics community, we have, we have to design the converters properly. Okay, the power density, the efficiency, thermal management, all these are important, but we should put some effort on this, okay, this system's problem, because this is going to be the next big, big problem, okay? And then we presented to you the concept of Sendam, centralization and democratization. Or for the power system is synchronized and democratized smart grids, okay? And we have shown you that we are able to achieve that. Okay, we are able to adopt the synchronization mechanism of synchronous machines as the natural rule of law for Sendam smart grid. And we are also able to equalize all the players, all the many of them, but we are also we are able to equalize them by using synchronous, virtual synchronous machines technology. Okay? And the very important thing here is that it doesn't require the communication network for the basic service. So that means we are going to significantly reduce the the concerns about the reliability of the communication network and also cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. Okay. So that is very, very important. I mentioned that we have got three generation of technologies available, and um, so there are probably uh, there will be more coming up. Okay. Yeah, in the future. Okay. Now, the conclusion is that we power electronics engineers will have our jobs secured for many years to come. As we are entering a new era, the AC era, okay? I know that we have been dominantly working on the DC, okay, DC area, DC, DC converters, but now the AC, DC to AC, uh, power electronic converters are really become a very, very big area, okay? And that is going to be uh, uh, offering our secure jobs in many years to come, okay? And I also have. Uh, I, this, this research has been ongoing for many, many years. Uh, now it's 16, 17 years now. And I had the, um, the privilege to work with many uh, world leading researchers. And uh, I, I'm not going to uh, read them out, so, um, I, but I really um, uh, thank them for the collaboration and the, um, the work together. And also I'd like to thank my founding bodies when I was in the UK. And we're trying to get some more funding from the US as well. Okay. There is one person particularly I would like to uh, mention, and that is Dr. Fred Nee. I think he is uh, somewhere there. Yes. And um, Dr. Nee, uh, he hosted my um, sabbatical nine months uh, in 2012, 2013, and uh, I really had some nice days with him, and I was very impressed by his ways of working, thinking, and all these things. And he's also a very nice human being. Uh, yeah, and uh, he, uh, when we visited him, uh, he, he took us um, to, with his boat and onto the, the, uh, onto the lake, and we had really nice days there. Okay, I really uh, uh, appreciate uh, what uh, he has done for me. And uh, very important, okay, these are the, the, the living side, or the life side, but very important is that when I was there, every time when he s saw me, he asked me, Qingchang, why don't, do you want to operate a power electronic converter as a virtual synchronous machine? Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do that? To be honest, I did that, but I didn't know why I wanted to do that. 
at that moment, even after five or six years. Okay, so we did the, the virtual synchronous machine in 2008, and then they operated the rectifier as the uh, virtual synchronous machine in 2010, and also removed the, uh, the PLL. But still, I didn't know why I wanted to do that. Eventually, after his uh, uh, days, days, and the asking, and then after I left him, I think, so, so we, I finally find, oh, I am looking for a mechanism. That is a synchronization mechanism. Okay, so that, that's, that's concluded my research in this area, more or less. Okay, so build up this theoretical framework. So I, that's why I really thank him for that. Okay, I also would like to thank my industrial uh, partners, many of them, and I've listed them here. And so I, it's, it's really good to have a wonderful industrial partners to, uh, to uh, feed you the challenges they are facing. Okay, that's very, very important. Okay. Now, uh, I, have, uh, I also would like to acknowledge the uh, source materials we took from the internet. Wonderful, internet is wonderful. Okay, also it's not the, the greatest engineering achievement in, uh, in the 20th century, but it's really wonderful. And uh, we took the materials there, and my family uh, worked together, my daughter and my wife, we worked together during last Christmas, and uh, prepared this 100-second uh, uh, video. I hope you like it. Okay, uh, now, I have shown you that we can all, all make a difference. Okay, we have set up a LinkedIn group on the um, virtual synchronous machines, and uh, if you are interested in this, then please join this. And also, we have set up a Sendam Alliance to try to establish the the Sendam ecosystem, so that we are able to get this deployed worldwide and to benefit our uh, all of us. Okay, so that is uh, what is our um, aim, and we're going to do it. Okay, and um, yes. And um, I have some takeaway messages here. Yes, the one thing is about um, complexity or simplicity. And I have a quote from Confucius. He said, life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. Yes, we always do that. Okay, I myself do that as well. Okay, but we shouldn't forget that there is a way for us to simplify our work. And that is probably a more challenging way. Okay, we shouldn't forget that. Okay, the simpler, the better. And uh, I, I, I had uh, something like simplicity is beauty, but I, I took it out from my, uh, my presentation. Okay, this is one message I'd like, uh, in particular for our um, uh, younger generations, to remember that. Okay, don't just go complex. Okay, go simple as well. Okay, the second message I would like to, um, to offer is this. Take one more step. Okay, always take an extra step. And in this case, I would like to say that from democratization to synchronization and democratization. Okay. Uh, another message is that we have shown you that we can harmonize future power systems by operating the power electronic converters in millions of incompatible players as virtual synchronous machines. And that will be able to make our planet more sustainable because this is the enabling technology okay, for our uh, sustainability. Okay. I also have a takeaway question for all of us. I'm showing you that we are able to do a lot of things about power electronics, power systems. So the question for you is that, can we harmonize ourselves? Can we harmonize ourselves? We are having a lot of troubles in the world. Can we harmonize ourselves? If we are able to do that, then we will be able to achieve the vision of I2B, advancing technology for humanity. Thank you very much.